something a little bit different for this episode. Something that is long overdue in a city that has long been underestimated. Yes, I know we did a Vilnius episode just a few months ago, but I've never been able to shake the feeling that we didn't do this place, one of my favorite cities in the world, justice. So once the gray of the cold Lithuanian winter had passed, it felt high time to return and focus not on transportation or money, but on something this city does better than almost every city I've ever been to, food. What even is this, Alex? I hear you saying a dedicated food video. I thought you didn't do those. An astute observation, you're right. I have heretofore resisted the temptation to do dedicated food videos about destinations. But I'll tell you something about me, something you probably already know, even if you're a casual visitor to this channel. I love food. And I particularly love food when I'm traveling. I think it's a great way to understand a city and its people and its rhythms and habits and quirks but most importantly, I think that this city, Vilnius, is criminally underrated when it comes to food. Plus, the last time we were here, the weather was less than welcoming, and I think this city deserves a chance to show off its best side. And finally, there is an event going on right now that, when I got wind of it, there was absolutely no way I was going to miss. So stay tuned for that and some of the best food in the world. There's an obvious and gaping hole in the attaché food canon, a blatant, frankly irresponsible hole, and that hole is breakfast. We've glossed over it over and over again, but we shan't here in Vilnius. There's too much goodness, too many breakfast treats we simply cannot ignore. So let's dive straight in, because otherwise I'm gonna come up with more ways to describe holes. Picture this. The misty cobblestone streets of Vilnius, once celebrated as the Jerusalem of the North. It's here in the alleys of the then Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that the bagel first makes its mark. Jewish bakers working in dimly lit bakeries and bustling markets churn out these doughy rings of perfection. Street vendors hawk them to passers-by, the air thick with the scent of freshly baked bread. This isn't just food, it's history culture, and a taste of an era where the bagel was king. But during and after World War II, much of the Jewish community in Lithuania fled, and they fled to places like Montreal and New York, home to iconic bagels themselves. But when they did leave, they took with them popular knowledge of the bagel. This once ubiquitous treat became a relic, an idea, a distant memory held only in the minds of old timers, until a revival. It only makes sense that our first stop is Beglestai, a beloved Vilnius vendor helmed by Nomeda, a bona fide authority on the subject. Most of, uh, of us think that uh, bagels are New York thing, yeah, but uh, not, uh, not many of us know that uh, bagels are from this part of the world. Uh, from Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth, uh, Ashkenazi Jews brought it overseas, and then Philadelphia was invented, and it boomed even more the popularity of of the bagel, and that's and then they returned here. And you helped? Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Let's be clear: bagels are a labor of love. Creating them takes two days of kneading boiling and baking to get that coveted crunch and doughy center. Not a process for the faint of heart. These are absolutely stunning. There's no elegant way to eat these, is there? No, but uh, I will listen to the sound. I love it so much when it's crisp. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you. And my friends, I am still thinking about that bagel. We talked half-jokingly in our dedicated Vilnius episode about the preconceptions we have about food from this part of the world. Not many of us can claim to have a working knowledge of Lithuanian food unless we've sampled its joys, so we, rightly or wrongly, make some assumptions. Lithuanian food, I have no idea, but I'm going to guess there's boiled meat, 
boiled potatoes, some sort of fish. Technically correct, but to quote Lisa Simpson, as usual, the playground has the facts right, but misses the point entirely. One of the many things I've learned about Lithuanian food over the years is that it is almost always greater than the sum of its parts. Like these, cepolini, the unofficial official national dish of Lithuania. It will be austerely described as potato dumplings made with riced and grained potatoes, stuffed with cheese curds or ground beef, which it sounds fine, I guess, but in reality, it's these beautiful, starchy blimps, blimps, hence the name Zeppelini, Zeppelin, filled with ground meat, cheese, covered in a cheese sauce made with bacon and then topped with bacon. I mean, talk about under-promise and over-delivered. They are delicious and satisfying and ubiquitous, and you cannot come to Vilnius or Lithuania without eating at least half a dozen of these. In a similar vein, kugelis, billed as potato pudding. What in the peasant pantry is that? Potatoes, bacon, milk, onions, and eggs are seasoned with salt and pepper and bay leaves and then baked in the oven, served with sour cream and very often bacon or a bacon sauce. So much better than its billing. Or how about ketadrona, fried bread? Okay, you got me with the fried, but it is so much more than that. It's this deep fried rye bread. Rye bread is a staple of Lithuanian cuisine, which is then rubbed with butter and garlic and served with a completely reasonable amount of cheese sauce. It is the ultimate Lithuanian beer snack. It's riffed on a little bit, but generally the concept remains the same and you will find it in every bar or every restaurant served as an appetizer or accompaniment to whatever frosty brew you're drinking. Confession time. I've had a few 10 plus course tasting menus in my life. One of the perks of this job, I guess. But it's not something that I naturally gravitate towards. Not really my jam. That doesn't mean I can't appreciate it, but it also means my patience for form over function, aesthetics over taste, is very limited. But Andreas, at 1918, put me firmly in my place with one of the most spectacular and delicious meals I've ever had in my life. Enjoy. Strap in people, this is absolutely spectacular. Savory bites lead the way. Perfectly pitched amuse-bouche flavored with beetroot, blueberry, and duck, followed by raw perch and Jerusalem artichoke. It's perfect. The kitchen soon presents us with the next plate, a cheese and beer shell topped with beef tartare and a special local touch. Hazelnut and carrot cream. Then we top it with roasted hazelnuts and finish with Lithuanian hard cheese, which is aged for at least five years. And just when one meaty delight begins to digest, they hit me with another one. For me, this dish actually represents the perfect idea of what could be a true Lithuanian street food if we ever had one. A donut bun filled with slow-cooked oxtail cooked in dark beer and glazed with pork lard aptly named the Homer. It was at this point I knew I had a new best friend. More clarred glaze all over my fingers. And here we have the true magic of a perfectly planned tasting menu. Sticky pork lard is promptly balanced with perfectly cooked local asparagus, topped with buckwheat popcorn, and drizzled with juniper-infused cream. Enjoy. With balance restored, it's time for a trip down memory lane. Dumplings for me represents love, care, and dedication. The story behind this is because my mother, she's a musician. She plays violin, and the story I'm telling is 1990s, 1995. My mom uh, played in a Lithuanian National Symphonic Orchestra, and the orchestra was always going for tours. Those tours were taking from two to six weeks. So my mom, before leaving to a tour, was in the kitchen in the evening, and she was uh, mincing meat, making dough, and making dumplings. She made so much of them that it barely could fit into the freezer. But what I know is my mama was sitting in the, in the kitchen to two or three o'clock in the morning and she had to leave at five or six. For me, that's love, care and dedication. The recipe of the dumplings, uh, the mixture of the meats and the dough is exactly the same as she does in Jaja. Love, care, dedication. That's unbelievable. It's absolutely delicious. Then, rather incredibly, steak, but topped with quite the heart stopper, I mean showstopper. We call it a chicken caramel. 
chicken caramel means that we boil uh, every week around 70 liters of chicken stock and then we reduce it to one. And then mix in just a little bit of butter. Because into one liter of uh, heavily reduced chicken stock, we we'll put from three to four kilos of butter. Here rests Alex, who died doing what he loves. Enjoy it and good luck. Chicken caramel is now my new favorite thing. Go and watch the Tokyo episode. There was a moment where I had uh, uh, Kobe beef for the first time, and I said, I don't know what to do from now on. What do I do now? Like, I don't even know what to do. 66 episodes later, this is one of those moments. As the end draws near, in more ways than one, we chase steak with burnt butter ice cream sprinkled with porcini mushroom dust. It's like a magician. And it was around this part of the evening that things began to blur a little bit. I'm fairly certain we were served booze by a unicorn. You guys can see that, right? And we ate the most delicious smoked ice cream flavored by and topped with ants. You guys can see those, right? You can really taste the ant. It is impossible to overemphasize just how spectacular and significant this meal was. Just a few days after our visit, Andreas and the team at 1918 were awarded a Michelin star, along with three other restaurants in Vilnius. There is magic happening every day at 1918 and across Vilnius, and I feel supremely fortunate to have witnessed their craft firsthand. Throughout the city, the Lithuanian proclivity for sweet treats is unabashedly on display. Every manner of sweet, pastry, cakes, and cookies with each one more tempting than the next. There are homegrown favorites too, like Tinganese, a concoction of biscuit crumbs, butter, sweetened condensed milk, and cocoa powder. And then there's this cherry bomb we stumbled upon. Inside of it, in this particular variant, beautiful dark cherries. Uh, the other ones were cottage cheese, which made Greg grudge a little bit, uh, rhubarb, pear, all kinds of things, but you can't go wrong with cherries, especially in this part of the world. Oh, that's good. It is, it's like a cherry danish. Lots of granulated sugar on top. Sweet and sour cherryness. Oh, good way to start your Lithuanian day. I gotta admit, I slightly underestimated this. Uh, I mean, let's be real, it's a festival in its second year, and it's a festival about cold soup. So I think that's why I set my expectations a little bit low. But look at it, there's 15,000 people here. There are 250 partners and activations across the entire city. Restaurants, hotels, cafes, all across the city are doing pink soup themed dishes, ideas, restaurants, snacks, giveaways, promos. People have come from all over the city and all over the country. We just talked to a guy who flew in from Africa this morning and came straight from the airport to here because nothing represents home and the spirit of this city quite like the Pink Soup. And this is just a fantastic event. Everybody's having a great time, including me. Throughout the city, restaurants, cafes, bars are doing activation, Pink Soup inspired activations, uh, including this one, which was pitched to us as deconstructed pink soup and all day I've been scratching my head trying to figure out what that might be. Uh, when in this was slid in front of me, it was not what I was expecting. It is stunning, minimalist. And then the beautiful work that the waitress did to pour the, the beetroot infused kefir over. It's, it's absolutely beautiful and I'm desecrating her hard work uh, and the chef's hard worker, but she did tell me to do this. I'm not breaking the rules. Uh, mix it all in, she said, and then take a little bite with the egg. Perfect riff and an already perfect dish. All in all, 42,000 people took part in this year's festival. And let's be clear, I love this soup, this perfect blend of beetroot, kefir, egg, cucumbers, and dill. Once again, exponentially greater than the sum of its parts. No wonder it's celebrated. And I encourage you to come along to next year's Pink Soup Fest on May 31st, 2025.
Vilnius is one of those rare cities that strikes the seemingly impossible balance between casual or street food, traditional and comforting staples, and cutting edge Michelin star worthy cuisine. None of them is more important than the other. None of them takes up more space or share a voice than the other. All of them are accessible to nearly everyone in their own ways. I cannot overemphasize how hard that balance is to strike. The quality runs across the entire spectrum. I don't know if that was by design or just the nature of Lithuanian food in the 21st century. Frankly, I don't really care. All I know is that it has given me one more reason to love this city even more than I already do. And while Vilnius might not be on everybody's travel radar yet, I urge you to add it to your bucket list and add it somewhere near the top. You'll thank me later.